So as the choir's coming down and, and finding their places, um, I want to share something with you this morning. So you notice I'm not wearing my little thing, right? Right? And and there was a re- there's a reason. Well, there's a couple reasons for it. One is is I'm I'm not going to be I'm not going to be bringing the message this morning. But um, we we and we'll talk about that in just a minute. But the other part is. Um, uh, Debbie kind of got on me last week after service. She said, I sure wish you would stand still. She said, you, you just, you wear me out moving back and forth. So I figured, well, if I don't put that little thing on and I have to talk into this, I'll have to stand right here in front of, in front of this right here. So I'm, I'm not, I'm not going to go back and forth. I'm going to stand right here for just a minute. But uh, look, I'm excited this morning. I'm, I'm really excited about our time together today. Uh, as you know, we've talked about it on Sunday mornings. We've been, we've been uh, involved in a Bible study on Wednesday nights. And, and, and before I get too far and I forget, I want to thank Catherine and I want to thank the choir because for the last six or seven weeks we've been impending or in, in, we've been infringing on, on choir time. We've been starting at 8.15 rather than, or, or they've been starting at 8.15 to give us time to try to get all of our Bible study in. So they've been starting a little bit later, which means they finish a little bit later. Of course, during the middle of the week, that's hard to do. And uh, but I want to thank them for allowing us to do that. We've had a great time these last few weeks together, and we've been involved in a Bible study called Survival Kid, and it's an old Bible study, and it's been around for a long time. I remember as a young Christian being involved in that Bible study, and um, I just remember what what it what it meant to me. And um, and you know, I kind of got to thinking about it, man. How much uh, you know we get so a- active and involved in in church and life and doing things. I had forgotten so much of just the wonderful things that I that I uh, learned uh, during that survival kit. So I said, man, I think that would be great. Whether whether you're a new believer or you're seasoned and you've been involved in God's work for a long time, what a great time to just go back and and look at those things again. So over the last few weeks. Uh, now the children and the youth, they've been doing this Bible study as well. They're not finished. They, they're, they're layout, their, their time frame is a little different than the adults. So they're still continuing in their Bible study. They'll be finishing up. But we finished up um, uh, the, the, the class part of it. Uh, I pray and I, and I shared uh, Wednesday night that I hope that, uh, you know, that this wasn't the end of that Bible study, but it was just the beginning of what God was going to do in that. But uh, just to let you know, so some of the, some of the things that we talked about over the last few weeks, and we talked about the foundation of of of, of God's word, the foundation we've got to have a good and solid foundation, and and that good and solid foundation that we have to have is the indwelling of Christ. And then we talked about being in the body, unity and life in the body, the church, and and how that works, how we're here for each other. And then we talked about the the two natures, the old and the the old that we were, and then when we get saved, the new man, the the new nature that we have, and how how they are constantly in a struggle. And then we talked about salvation, past, present, and future, uh, justification, uh, sanctification, and glorification. We talked about those things, and then we talked about the one complete source that we have. One complete, uh, um, um, uh, unfailing, without error source, and 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 that is uh, scripture. That is scripture. And we talked about all those things, and it led up to the last last week, and we finished up. And the theme of that was was uh, ten, ten you can win. It's what we talked about, and it was talking about our, our two hands and and how how five we can have five on one hand, five names. Five names of people that we can we can pray for that that you wanna you wanna you wanna witness to that you wanna reach out to but they they hold you off at a distance they just won't allow you to get that close that you can share your testimony that five and then we talked about another five that we could witness to five people that we know in our lives ten you can win so um, we, in our last week uh, it was it was the uh, kind of the culmination of all those things bringing us up to our testimony, our, our, our witness, uh, what God's done for us, what Christ has done for us in our lives. So I asked some folks, I just asked, I said, uh, this Sunday, would you, uh, would somebody be willing to come and share uh, their testimony? Uh, what God, just a simple story of what God's 
uh, how God how how God called you and how He spoke to you and how uh, how He's working in your life. And so uh, didn't have any problem and, and had several volunteers. Um, so I want you to know this morning uh, we've got some folks that are coming and they're coming with an intentional faith this morning, an intentional heart. They want to share uh, what Christ is doing. I want to share a couple of scriptures and then and then. Um, uh, and we'll, and we'll move along. But um, I want to share with you, if you have your Bibles, and I hope that you do, if you'll turn to Matthew chapter 28 and look at verses 18 through 20. And I know when you get there, you'll recognize this. Scripture. And, and, and by God's grace this morning, we're, we're going we're gonna to live out this Scripture uh, this morning. The beginning of this, the beginning, li, begin to live this scripture out. I hope we're already living it out. But Matthew chapter 28, starting in verse 18. And Jesus came and spoke to them, saying, All authority has been given to me in heaven and on earth. Go therefore and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all things that I have commanded you. And lo, I am with you always, even to the end of the age. Amen. So, with that being said again, uh, uh, we, this morning, uh, those that are coming uh, to share, uh, they are coming in obedience to God's Word, uh, to Jesus' calling to share that testimony. And it's starting right here. So, with that said... We'll just, uh, we'll go ahead and, and get started. Hi. <laughs> um, I, um, when, when, when Bobby asked Wednesday night if, and you know, there were, I was, I was tired Wednesday night and I started not to come to Bible study Wednesday night and you know, I started to use that time because you see in the bulletin I'm leading the Psalm 23 study um, on the 12th and 19th, and that is a phenomenal book. I encourage all women to come and hear about the book and um, get that information. But I started to I started to work on that instead of coming to Bible study Wednesday night. If I had not come to Bible study Wednesday night, I wouldn't be here. So when Rick sits here and says that, you know, there are jobs for everybody to do and there are things for everybody to do, you know, he's speaking to every one of us. God's speaking to every one of us. If he's speaking to your heart about, you know, I wish you were doing so-and-so or I wish you were in church more, whatever, then that's, you know, I'm just sharing what the Lord's laying on my heart because as you can see, I have no notes and I haven't prepared anything. Um, when I was a young girl, I grew up in the church, so to speak. My parents took me to Sunday school at St. Paul's Lutheran Church, um, and um, I even went through catechism at St. Paul's Lutheran Church, which meant that, you know, I could take communion at that church, and I was a member of that church. Um, you know, and I don't know whether it was the messages that were brought at that church or whether it was my heart or whether it was the world. But for whatever reason, I didn't know about a relationship with Jesus Christ. I didn't know that was a possibility. I, I had not heard that. I missed that message somewhere that Sunday. Somewhere I missed that message. And um, so I... Um, but I can remember um, in my young childhood years, sitting, I grew up on the farm, sitting on daddy's fence, looking out at the pastures, at the beautiful flowers blooming up in the wildflowers blooming in the pastures and the bees buzzing. And I would just sit there and sing to the Lord, I'd sing to the Lord. Well, when I got to high school, I started to sing to another Lord, okay? Um, I was in a rock and roll band and um, I was wild and crazy. And, um, you know, 
some of the things I did would probably turn the hair up, stand straight up on your arm for what I did. I was, if there was, um, if there was going to be a party on the weekend, most of the friends knew it's going to be at Catherine's. Okay. Um, and um, not that I'm proud of that, but just to say, I never, again, I never heard that I can have a relationship with Jesus Christ. I didn't know about that. And so I was still always searching for something as I grew up. Um, met a wonderful man and got married, praise the Lord. Um, he sent Benny to one of my parties. Yeah. <laughs> and um, so, you know, you can see the, the end of that, that story because we're still together, praise the Lord, because God has been working in my life. And, and, I, and part of the reason he worked in my life, because at that time in our marriage, you know, I was a, a um, what do you call it, when you go to church on just the holidays? I was a holiday girl. So, you know, Easter, Christmas, that kind of thing. Um, but um, then we, then I started, well, then I, then I, then I had a, a daughter. And I'm like, mm, she needs to be in Sunday school. You know, my mom and daddy took me to Sunday school, so I need to take her to Sunday school. So that's what I did. Like a good mother, I would bring her to Sunday school while Benny went off playing golf on Sunday morning. So, um, and that's his testimony, I won't go there. But anyway, um, then at the time, um, again, I was hearing a message about Jesus Christ and also I had two very special ladies and I'm sure probably more than that, um, probably still in this church, praying for me um, because when we moved into that house two doors down on the other side of the parsonage um, if you notice there's a huge red tip bush there between my house directly between my house and the parsonage so that you know I can't you can't look into each other's windows which is really nice because that's a bedroom window on theirs it's our dining room window so it's nice that the red tip is there for that reason um, but not so much for privacy there used to be a whole line of red tips there, and they were planted when we bought that house with my frame of mind that, you know, I don't want Megan Baptist Church to be seeing everything that I'm doing. Because I was still a party girl. I hadn't come to know Christ as my Lord and Savior when he moved us in that old parsonage house. And if you notice, too, every red tip died <laughs> on its own accord everyone God took them out and it's such a blessing because um, and, and, and they started dying away as a path started coming from the parsonage to my house um, because after I got saved I became sisters in Christ with another um, minister's wife. So having said all that, there were two ladies that prayed, I uh, know, fervently for me. Um, they would even stop by after their busy day of work and pray with me or on the weekend if they saw me out in the yard. They would just stop and they would just come and talk with me and then they would say, well, can I pray with you? And um, so I know they were praying, and they would come and knock on my door, and they say, you know, we want to have prayer time with you, and um, and that was Paula King and Ruby Dickerson, and if it had not been for those two ladies, I probably would not be standing here because I was a party girl, and that's what I was, I was, that's where I was headed, but I was searching, I was searching when I moved into that house. I was searching before I moved into that house. I would still be searching today for something to fill my life had I not come to that saving, submitting, asking Christ into my heart, saying, Lord, take the wheel. I can't do this. I'm not happy. I'm not, it's not where I need to be. Something's not right. I can tell it. You take over. And had I not done that, I wouldn't be here today. And I, I still fall short. I still fall short. 
but he is um, there for me. All I have to do is call on him. Just the mention of your name. All I have to do is call on him. And he gets me out of whatever bind I'm in. That doesn't mean I won't have consequences for that bind, but he helps me through it. And those are multiple other testimonies that I could give. So I just encourage everybody to give the Lord a chance if you haven't. And, and if you just need to reopen that, that, that pathway between you and the Lord and that line of communication, I, I encourage you to do that. And so. so nervous and I did write notes because I was afraid I would get up here and go blank <laughs> but um, I can identify with Catherine I promise you <laughs> I grew up also I grew up in Atlanta Georgia I was a city girl when I first came here I'm sure Cheryl would, would love to attest to that and fill y'all in but I did have a good family I had a good childhood but I was raised Roman Catholic and I mean, when I say Roman Catholic, I mean all the way, the Catholic schools and catechism on Sunday and the whole nine yards. I knew a lot about Catholic doctrine, I knew a lot about catechism, and I knew nothing about Jesus, very little about Jesus. Um, the religion that I was raised in was a religion of works. You were always to work and hope that you would be good enough and that possibly you would make it to heaven and not have to go to purgatory, which that's another subject, but anyway. So that's how I was raised. And then I went away to college, and I went uh, a long way away. I was four and a half hours away. I didn't have to worry about my parents looking over my shoulder or seeing what I was up to. And I did take, I fell full force into the ways of the world. And I'll just say that I had the full college experience, and I'm not talking about studying in classes. <laughs> and that's all I'm going to say. <laughs> um, and I didn't think much about God. I just really didn't think much about God. Then I got married, and I married a, a good, decent man. We were both lost, but we were, we were good people. But you know what? I knew right away that I'd made a horrible mistake. But because, um, just because, I just knew I had married the wrong person. But because of the Catholic background, a divorce was the worst thing in the world. And it's still, I'm not saying it's not, not still, but nobody in my family had gotten a divorce. So I stayed in the marriage for a long time. And, but finally, I just believed the world, and the world kept telling me, you need to be happy. You know, it's okay. You need to be happy. So I left him, and, um, and I left him. Um, we, and, you know, I was lost. He was lost. And then I married Robert, and he also had been raised in church. He had been raised in the Methodist church. But like me, he hadn't really regularly attended church after he was grown. So when we got married, we were both kind of searching. We both had, you know, previous first marriages, and we, we wanted our marriage to work. We didn't want to ever get a divorce. And we just, we were, tr we were trying to, you know, we wanted, to, we wanted our marriage to work, and we wanted it to be on a solid foundation, and so we wanted to get back in church. And so we went to, we started going to Hebron United Methodist Church, where most of the Rosses were going at the time. And we went regularly, and I was, we were pretty involved, and we were, you know, trying to lead good lives. <clears throat> and, um, and they sent a woman preacher to Hebron. And we didn't know very much, still lost, but it just, she said from up here that the Bible was a guideline, and that, that kind of, was the final straw, so we, we just stopped going. You know, Methodists, you just have to wait it out, and then a couple years you get a new preacher. So that was kind of our mindset. Um, in the meantime, 
we decided to send Melissa to Norlana Christian School. Not because we cared anything about her getting a Christian education, but just because at the time we thought it was the best option for her. So smaller classes and, you know, just we just thought that's what we needed to do. And so it wasn't long until Melissa was wanting to go to um, Gospel Baptist Church, which was the church that was affiliated with that school. And, you know, she wanted to start going to Awana because that's where her friends were, and she wanted to start going to church on Sunday. Well, I'll just say that we resisted, to say the very least, because coming from a Catholic background, there's pretty much not anything worse than a Baptist. <laughs> my <parents. laughs> Am I right? <laughs> um, <laughs> so we resisted. But after a year or so, we finally relented because these seeds had been planted along the way, you know, at different school functions, school conferences, school programs, etc. So it was actually around Easter time, <laughs> you know, the holiday people, around Easter time that we went for the very first time to Gospel Baptist Church. And my husband got saved the very first Sunday. And I mean, he got saved, but it was a funny thing was is that when he went down to the <coughs> altar, he yanked me with him. I don't, you know, and I don't know, I don't remember even really talking to the preacher, but I just remember all of a sudden everybody thought I was saved, you know. So, but I'm gonna tell you, um, and even a few weeks later, I did make a public profession at that church. But I'm gonna tell you, Robert's conversion was real that time. His was real. There was a real change came in his life and his was real. Mine, not so much. But I did go to church, and I went to Sunday school, and I began to study the Bible, because I've always liked school, I've always liked to study. You know, I had some really good teachers, and I acquired a lot of head knowledge. I knew a whole lot up here. But I had never really surrendered my heart, and I knew it inside, and I was having those nagging, nagging doubts about my salvation and where I would go if something happened to me. And, um, and then, so that was around Easter time. So then in September, I went to a Bailey Smith crusade at Vance Granville Community College. And I don't know if any of you know who he is, but he was a red-headed, fiery evangelist. <laughs> and, that night, I came away feeling even more unsettled and, you know, even angry that he make, was making me doubt so much. And I just kept trying to push those doubts down, and I was really struggling. Really, I was struggling with pride because everybody thought I was saved, and I just couldn't bring myself to let them know that I really wasn't saved and I needed to be saved. And it, it was a, a pride issue. And I can't believe I'm saying this because I've really never given my whole testimony in this church, so I'm really nervous. But anyway, so um, I was struggling with the pride issue, and I, and, and I just, you know, kept trying to rationalize it away that, you know, it, I didn't really have a problem, you know. But over the course of the few week, next few weeks, just remarks everywhere. They were like arrows just to my core, you know, and I just knew. And so one Sunday morning, I woke up early, and I woke my husband up, and I told him, I said, you know what, I'm not saved. And um, I told him what had been going on and how I was feeling. And he said, well, we're going to take care of that. So we got up, and we got dressed, and we went to church early that morning, and we sought out um, my associate pastor and my Sunday school teacher. Makes me think of Jean Bowen. I wish she was here because we went to church together then at that church. And that was the church that I got saved in. Anyway, um, so I, I told Walt well, that I knew, you know, I knew all about Jesus but I, in my head, but I had never really surrendered my heart. So I did that, that morning. And um, that was October 22nd, 1995. And I was 39 years old. I've been saying 38 for a long time. But that's just because I stink at math. <laughs> but I was, I was 39 years old. So, um, and I can't express to you the joy that I felt. I knew what joy was for the first time in my life. I really did. And so, anyway, I just want to say, you know, that it hadn't always been easy, but my faith did grow for a lot of years. 
And, you know, I got, was really involved here. You know, I taught and I was involved and Robert was involved. And I had a good relationship with Jesus for many years. And then I hit a season of grief in my life that, like none other that I'd ever, ever hit. And, you know, first was my husband's, you know, long illness and death. I know a lot of you are here that remember him and remember how it was. And then, uh, you know, that was a, a long ordeal, a year and a half or so. And then not too long, maybe a year after that, my only child, my daughter, Melissa, was involved in a life-threatening, life-altering accident, 11 surgeries, and almost two years of recovery in her life. You know, she's a miracle, and I'm thankful to God, but her life is, is different now. It's not like it was. Um, and, then, and then my younger sister, four years younger, the one that I grew up with, that I shared my room with, that I loved so much, died suddenly. And that, you know, you're never promised tomorrow. She went to sleep one night, and she didn't wake up. So I'm ashamed to say, but I got so angry at God, and I took my eyes off of him. I took my eyes off of Jesus, and I focused only on my circumstances. And I turned my back on Jesus. He didn't, he didn't turn. It wasn't the other way around. It was me. But you know what? The Lord's forgiving, and he's always ready to welcome his children back. And I hadn't been in church, you know, after coming and being so involved. I mean, I hadn't set foot in this church in several years at that point, two or three years. And so the morning after Eileen died, somebody pulls up in my driveway and I look out the window and it's Terry Breen, who I hadn't seen, you know, in several years because I hadn't been here, and a man I had no idea who he was. <laughs> <laughs> and I'm like, hadn't slept the night before. It was literally the next morning. I wasn't dressed, I and mean, I was in my nightgown room, and I'm, I can't imagine what I looked like. I'd cried all night. And they came in, and I, I later found out it was because Stella Wright had to let them know. But anyway, um, they showed so much compassion. Bobby didn't know me at all, but he, his prayer was from the heart, and it made a difference in my life. And Terry's made a difference in my life. And so I'm thankful that the Lord brought them to me. I'm thankful that they brought me back to church. I'm thankful to be here. I'm thankful for you all. And um, I just, that's it. I just, I pray that uh, each, if there's anybody in here that doesn't know the Lord, this is a great place to, to get to know him. And we'll help you. We'll lead you. You, you know, you can talk to Bobby, you can talk to anybody you feel comfortable with that you know, and we will be happy to talk to you. <laughs> and that's it. Thing, it'll be my knees knocking and my stomach crowding. <laughs> when Bobby asked for volunteers um, Wednesday night, my hand definitely didn't go up because I do much better with written communication than I do oral. But I went home and I thought, you know, if you can't get up there, the Lord has been so good to you all your life. If you can't get up there and praise Him for saving you from an eternal hell, there's something wrong with you. But anyway, um, and my Catherine, I really related a lot of her. It's not that I did the same things, but my journey has been all about going from a head knowledge to a heart knowledge. But and I'm gonna start when I was when I was young, my parents divorced when I was two years old. My grandmother raised me and my mama was more like a sister to me really most of my life um, than anything else. But um, my grandfather was an alcoholic. I was a super sized kid, nerdy. So anyway, I my but my grandmother she always made a way for me to go to Sunday school and church, even if she couldn't go herself. So through that, I was saved at 13. I have no doubt I was saved, but, you know, as a lot of us, we slide away. And, and I went into my adult 
early adult years with a lot of resentment, anger towards my father in particular. And to be honest, I didn't get that right while he was living, but hopefully in heaven I have a chance and I've asked the Lord to forgive me for my ugliness to him. I didn't, never got to see him until I was 11 years old. He lived in Atlanta and anyway, um, but anyway, I'm going to fast forward and get to the, the good part. Um, so as I said, I went into my adult, early adult life with a lot of resentment, anger. Um, and I always went to church and, like Catherine, took my daughter when she got old enough to start going because I knew she needed to go. But my heart was not in it. I was, it really scares me now to think about how cold and apathetic, apathetic I had gotten to the Lord the Bible, the things of the Lord. And anyway, fast forward about another 20 years when, um, and I think God gives us teenagers and young adults sometimes to humble us. And that's when, and a lot of stuff, other stuff, personal stuff was going on at that time. That's when I really dropped to my knees and said, Lord, come into my life. I know I've avoided you all this time, but I need you. You know, I'd been in control all that time before, but I knew. I needed the Lord, and that's just basically when my head knowledge became my heart knowledge, and like everybody else in here, I sure don't get it right a lot of the times, but there's, I know these two things without question. My God is always faithful, whether I am or not. He will never leave me or forsake me, and as that song says, I'd rather have Jesus and riches and gold. I'd rather be his than have I think I've got it mixed up already, but I'd rather be his and wealth untold. So, anyway, that, that's basically my little story. <laughs> we're, we're running close to time, so I'm going to ask like Paul did. In the 26th chapter of Acts, when he went before King Agrippa, that you just listen to me patiently for a few more minutes as I share my testimony. Sometimes I wish I had the exact date written down of when I was saved, but I don't. It was at the close of Vacation Bible School after our commencement program, and I heard the story about the rich man and the poor man. And I realized that I did not have Jesus in my heart. I realized I was a sinner, and I realized there was a heaven and there was a hell that awaits for each of us after death. And understanding that Jesus died for my sins, and I knew I wanted to be with Jesus in heaven, I asked Jesus in my heart. My age, I'm not sure of. It was probably around nine. It's like the date, I'm not sure of it, but the one thing that I do know is that on that night, my name was written in the Lamb's Book of Life, and Jesus has the date. Now, I had been raised in church since birth, so I had a pretty good understanding of the Bible stories that were taught in Sunday school and vacation Bible school and at other times. But the night I asked Jesus into my heart, the Holy Spirit moved my heart to show me my need, and it all made sense of what I had been taught a lesson to all of us as adults. We should never underestimate the teaching and understanding that young children get when they're brought to church. I was taken to church every Sunday by a godly Christian mother. She lived her life for Christ and set an example before me. I also know that her mother, my grandmother, prayed earnestly for all her children and grandchildren to be saved and to one day join her in heaven. These two women were instruments that God gave in my life to show me Jesus. Their prayers were heard and they were answered. However, Satan used circumstances in my childhood to plant his lies in my life. You see, my earthly father was an alcoholic. And the older he got, the worse his problem got. And the older I got, the more Satan used his lies in my life to deceive me and plant strongholds. We know that is exactly what Satan is. He's a liar, a deceiver, who comes to kill, steal, and destroy, because that's what the Bible tells us. 
But the Bible also tells us that Jesus comes so that we might have life and have it abundantly. And once we're his, Satan can't have us. And he'll try to paralyze us so that we cannot be effective for Jesus. The number one lie in my life was if my earthly father didn't love me as he should, how in the world could a heavenly father who I had never seen love me? You see, I was an only child. I was born 13 years after my parents were married and after several miscarriages. So there were no siblings to compete for my earthly father's love. The addiction to alcohol, however, interfered in so many aspects of our lives. As long as I can remember, there were secrets. I had to keep the fact that Daddy had a drinking problem, and there were unpleasant times at home, and we didn't want anybody to know about that. There were lies from an earthly father who didn't always keep his word. There were times I even lied to keep the secrets from my family and friends about my father. There was a lack of self-worth. I always tried to be a child that parents could be proud of and do my best. And there was, you know, always a sense of not quite measuring up or being enough at least to make a change in my dad. I was not worthy. When a parent doesn't give a child the love that that child needs, I think that child often internalizes that to mean that they're not really worthy to be loved. And then fear, that was a biggie. Fear of what will happen next, where will we go, what will we do, how will he come home tonight? Well, around the age of 23, after multiple times of leaving home, staying with family or friends and returning back, my mom and I left for the final time out of fear of physical abuse toward my mom. Now, Satan showed me very well at that point how to be bitter and how to be angry. At 24 years old, I married the love of my life, Carl. And from the beginning, I worked to prove my worth to my husband. I felt I needed to prove I was worthy of his love. But the question always returned, could I be loved? I was often fearful of losing his love, not from him in any way. He's been a blessing from God and has always been faithful and true. But it was hard for me to accept his love or the love of any human if I could not accept the love Jesus had for me. Satan lied in my marriage with fear and the not being worthy in marriage. Five years later, at the age of 29, my father died suddenly from a heart attack. As his only child, I received from his estate $10. His friends received the rest. He had divorced my mom some years earlier. So Satan really used this to confirm I was not loved, not worthy, and there was more anger and bitterness that filled my heart. God blessed me by the age of 34 with three beautiful children. You know them, Roger, Melissa, and Kimberly. I, the more I desired to be a godly mother, the more Satan lied to me to vent my anger and my bitterness on them. You know, the least little thing, I'd feel that surge of anger build up in me, and I'd be in a rage of angry, screaming words before I knew it. And after each episode, my self-worth was lowered, and I was not worthy to be loved by God or my family, according to Satan. April 1994 comes. I'm now at that point 43 years old which at that time I thought was really old until I'm my age today. <laughs> God was so patient with me, as he is with all of us, because he continued to pull me toward him as I sought him. I needed to know his love for me. I had a head knowledge, as Diane said, but it hadn't caught up in my heart. 
Because of all Satan's lies over my lifetime, it blocked that heart knowledge of his love. God showed me that in order to be able to receive the love of my family or anyone else, I had to receive his love. Ephesians 13, 16 through 20 became my prayer. I pray that out of his glorious riches, he may strengthen you with power through his spirit in your inner being, so that Christ may dwell in your hearts through faith. And I pray that you, being rooted and established in love, may have power together with all the saints to grasp how wide and long and high and deep is the love of Christ, and to know this love that surpasses knowledge, that you may be filled to the measure of all the fullness of God. God's love has no end. And I wanted to grasp how wide and long and high and deep. I wanted to grasp a mu as much of that love as possible. God showed me this is not between you and your husband, your children, your mother, or anybody else. This is between me and you, Faye. I went forward in church asking for prayer. And for the first time in my life, three people were praying over me. And I heard the ones, words of one say, Satan, you've lied to this woman long enough. God was continuing a plan he had for me. He began to show me that I could not receive his love and healing and be able to love others with the strongholds in my life. He led me to the powerful scripture of 2 Corinthians 10, 3 through 5. For though we live in the world, we do not wage war as the world does. The weapons we fight with are not the weapons of the world. On the contrary, they have divine power to demolish strongholds. We demolish arguments and every pretension that sets itself up against the knowledge of God. And we take captive every thought that sets itself up against the knowledge of God. And we, I repeat myself, and we take captive every thought to make it obedient to Christ. So for about 10 months, I prayed for the strongholds in my life to be demolished. And even though I had given him bits and pieces of my anger and my bitterness, God helped me to realize that on my own, I could not do it. He led me to ask for help and supplied people to pray with, with me and over me. February 13th, 1995 comes. I spent that morning with God in his word. He confirmed to me that morning, this was my day of deliverance. Psalm 46, 10, he said to me, cease striving or be still and know that I am God. Striving was exactly what I had been doing for years. I was so tired of striving Striving to be a wife that was worthy of love. A mom who could love her children as God desired. A daughter who was worthy to be loved. But most of all, striving to do everything just right to be loved by God. So that night, Everything that was accomplished through my prayers and the prayers prayed over me were accomplished through the name of Jesus and through his blood. I admitted to God I could not demolish the strongholds, but that he had the power to do so. I laid my heart open before him to work. Nothing can stand in the way of God's power. God's deliverance in my life from the lives of Satan were gone one by one that night. Bitterness and anger were the only two that I consciously was aware of until that night. But as God revealed others, he delivered me from them. And God sealed my deliverance that night with the picture of the pigs from the fifth chapter of Mark that gives the account of Jesus sending the evil spirits from a man into a herd of pigs and they rushed down a steep bank into a lake and were drowned. Well, Jesus took my strongholds that night and they were drowned. 
It was interesting because I had given this testimony in my church up to this point. And as I was planning for this morning, I thought, what an awesome God. Because I stand here before you 24 years later. And I know beyond a shadow of a doubt, I'm a child of the King. I'm loved by a Heavenly Father who's my Abba. I'm worthy of his love because of his son, Jesus, and what he did when he died on the cross for my sins. He washed them white as snow. I'll stand unblemished one day before God because of the blood of Jesus, as if I've never done anything wrong. Do I have fears? Do I lose my patience sometimes? Yeah. But you know what? Satan continues to try to attack where we're weak. But in the name of Jesus, I can tell him to be gone. He cannot have me because I'm a child of the king. I, love, I have a loving savior that I can run to for rest, reassurance, forgiveness, and strength. His word has provided promises over and over for me to claim daily when I battle with Satan's lies. Romans 8, 38 and 39 is a great reassurance. For I am convinced that neither death nor life, nor, neither angels nor demons, neither the present nor the future, nor any powers, neither height nor depth, nor anything else in all creation will be able to separate us from the love of God that is in Christ Jesus our Lord. My heart knows my Savior's love, and because of his love, I can love others as never before. There is no love like his. We can look this world over for all the things we think that will give us love. And the ways of this world will lead us to all the wrong places to try to find the love. But nothing will ever satisfy our hungry souls but the perfect love of Jesus. What God did for me wasn't just for me. Today was an opportunity to share it with you. I'm not the only one he desires to deliver, heal, or set free. He can do it for you too, whatever the need may be. Just come to him. He's able, he's willing, he's waiting. Yes, ma'am. Okay. I was born into a Methodist family. If anybody, it, I mean, my brothers, my daddies, and all them, if you married into that family, you became a Methodist. Raised a Methodist. I can see myself right now, don't have a clue what it meant, but I can see myself right now sitting on the front row of that church with a white dress on and white shoes to be baptized. Don't have a clue what that meant, but I was baptized. Okay. Then I marry a Methodist, just change over to another building, another church. Raised my children that way, had them dedicated. I don't clue what that means either now. I had the, they were baptized when they were about 12 years old. I thought that meant you were saved or something. I don't know. So. That was my life for I don't know how many years. Four children. Okay, my oldest daughter, Cynthia, who is about 53 now, so I don't know how many years ago it was, when she was a teenager, she had friends or whatever, and she went to another church and to another conference or whatever. And she come home telling me about being saved. Well, that meant absolutely nothing to me. 
what? And, and, I, and I really thought, how can somebody be younger than me, <laughs> my child, more or less had this experience or whatever, but she did. And for, for her 11th and 12th grade high school, she went to School of Math and Science, Durham. And she'd called me up and she said, Mama, there are people up here that worship the devil. I said, well, Cynthia, everybody's not a Christian. Mama, that is not what it means at all. Them folks are worshiping the devil. It still didn't really sink in or whatever. Okay, go ahead with my life or whatever. Then my daughter Crystal, who was later diagnosed as bipolar, but I didn't know what was wrong with the child. I thought she had to be on drugs, she had to be doing this or whatever. She just kind of turned into another person or whatever. So I'm going everywhere looking for help for this child. So Al Anon, that's for families and that's for families and friends that have been affected by somebody's alcoholism. So I go there. Y'all got to save my child from whatever's wrong with her. And they told me, Al-Anon is for not for that person. Al-Anon was for me, us. Well, you can take my word for it. I left there kind of mad because they weren't going to save my child. But I did go back the next time, and I'd go back the next time. And somebody would say something that really made me mad, <laughs> and I left there mad. But I'd go back the next time, and I'd go back the next time. Well, there was this woman, Adeline Kerr from Butlin, that's her name. Lord, thank you, Lord, for her. But I would be griping, or I would be doing this, and I would be doing that. And there was somebody in my life at that time that I really wasn't too pleased with. And I'd go in there complaining. And I remember it. And she told me, Kathleen, she said, Alice, pray for this person. I said, yeah, right. I'll pray to get run over with by 18 women. <laughs> but you know, I found out I couldn't pray to get run over with by 18 women. And, and then I think before that was gratitude. And I asked her, I mean, I mean, ashamed of myself and all this. Gratitude, and I asked, I said, what in the carnation have I got to be thankful for? And this is what she said to me. It looks like you ate today. <laughs> 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 and you got here somewhere, how? And I think you got some probably somewhere to go home. Okay. So this goes <laughs> on and on. And so, and I'm sure this was the Lord or whatever, spoke to me or whatever. It was like this woman had something that I wanted. I mean, she made me mad as far about that praying for somebody and gratitude and all like that, but she had something I wanted. And so, finally, I got up the nerve or whatever after a meeting, and I said, you got something I want. What is it? And she told me it was Jesus Christ. So that's when I met, I mean, I don't know, in an Al-Anon room is where I meet Jesus Christ as my Lord and Savior. Okay, I do this. But still, I haven't got what it takes or whatever. At this Methodist church I am, to just leave or just whatever. I mean, on Sunday morning, I'm in this church, rested, you know. And so finally, one of the ministers they sent, I mean, it kind of hit me kind of hard that I don't know, that person wasn't a minister, I don't know where, where they came from or whatever. But that's what it took for me to say, next Sunday morning, y'all won't be seeing, I mean, you know, I didn't say it. So 
I said, I'm going to other churches. Give them two Sundays in a row. Two Sundays. If it works, it works. If it don't, I ain't going back there no more. And so I'll tell y'all, the Sunday I was coming down here, <laughs> I prayed all the way home. Dear Lord God, don't let me sit in nobody else's seat. Dear Lord God, don't let me sit in nobody else's seat. That's what I prayed. Well, when I drove up, and who was standing on the front porch? Lisa Haithcock. Somebody that I had been praying for for years. Now, if that ain't yard, I don't know what it is. Another thing. I'll add this or whatever. All, all these years I was in church and church and church. I don't remember anybody ever doing it or whatever. But last year, year four last, I can't even keep up anymore. Crystal, my daughter, has had heart attacks. She has heart, whatever. And so I think of last year or whatever, and she was at work, and she's having chest pains, and she's having all this, and. EMS and whatever takes her to Duke. And the next morning, before I get up just about, Bobby Harrell calls me up. He said, Alice, you want to go see Crystal? Of course I did. I said, when? He said, about 15 minutes. And I said, 15 minutes, I'll be ready. He took me. He witnessed the crystal. And I'll, I just want to say how thankful I am for making Baptist Church. I hope all Baptist Church are like this. I don't ring the all, but, but I hope they are. And I just want to say thank you for everybody that loves me and puts up with me and everything else. Thank you. Our time is, is late. Uh, we had some others that, that said they would share the testimony. And um, we'll, uh, we'll save that for another time. Um, I want you to always know that um, there's always time, though, for, for testimonies and for sharing and just your story. Uh, whatever your story is with Christ, how he's worked and moved in your life. I want you to know this morning, if you're here and you don't have a testimony because you don't have a relationship with Jesus Christ, I don't want you to leave this place this morning without that relationship and that testimony. And, you know, if we don't accomplish another thing, we'll do that. Um, I hope that the testimonies that were shared this morning or things that spoke to you. You can relate to those things in your life. Uh, maybe somebody said something that brought back something that you remembered or, or something, whatever that is. You know, our testimony. That's God's story in our life. That's Christ's story in our life. And, and it's important and it needs to be told. Uh, you know, we shared it here uh, in this church this morning. Now I want to encourage you to go out and share it outside this church with those that you work with, those that you live with, those that are your neighbors, whoever it is. If it's just some stranger in the line at food line, just, just uh, share uh, what Christ has done for you in your life. That's what we're called to do. As a matter of fact, it's, it's not a suggestion. That's how I think that's how I ended up when he's not. It's, it's really not a suggestion. It's a command. And it's a prayer and a want to for Christ. Yes, ma'am. Absolutely. I've been sitting there getting convicted, so I'm going to say something. Y'all bear with me. This past Wednesday night, when our Bible study ended, Bobby asked for five people to give their testimony on Sunday morning, as we know already, 
and five volunteered, but that was not me. I immediately felt um, disappointed with myself because I knew I should have, uh, as we all should, raise my hand without any hesitation. I know the devil was working on me, pointing out fears or weakness, and I let him. And so when I got home, I ever, after everybody had gone to bed, I sat at my desk and I started pouring all this out on paper. I can handle paper. The worst time of my life was Vance Granboy in public speaking. <laughs> I hated that. Um, I felt mad at that point when I sat at my desk because I let Satan get to me, and I know better. We have a forgiving God. Um, I should gladly give testament of God's work in my life as easy as breathing. Because isn't this he that gave us the breath of life? I have froze at the thought of speaking to you all in this capacity, and I'm scared to death right now. But if I can't stand here and profess my faith and love in Jesus Christ in front of fellow believers, what does that say of my willingness to serve God? I want to be a doer and not a seamer for Christ. So I'm standing here now out of my comfort zone because of the certainty that Jesus did far from me when he carried my sin all the way to death for me to have life. I was raised in this church and had many godly influences and wonderful memories. I am so thankful that my girls are here now to experience the same. For quite a few years, I strayed away when the wonders of the world came crashing in, and I believe that strong foundation I got right here growing up, and God's nudging me back in the right direction is brought me back to where I needed to be. I was saved at about 12 or 13, and I was baptized right there. I knew what I did that day. It wasn't a passive experience. I believed in Jesus and God's saving grace, but, it's always a but, I wasn't in true fellowship with Christ. I have that now. I have the Holy Spirit believing in me and guiding me. I have a need now to be in his presence, to fellowship with other believers, and for his word. The closer I get to him, the better even the worst days become. Because I think differently, I react differently, I pray differently. We've all searched for that true happiness on the wide road of the world to no avail. Because the validation we need is on the narrow road that leads to Christ. I searched a great deal in years past for unconditional love turning myself into that yes person, no confidence, social anxiety version of myself that I didn't like. When you're young and trying to figure out who you are in the world, condition love is very damaging. But that's okay because I have the ultimate, unconditional, all-powerful love of Jesus. I thank him for Johnny, who's always had my and our, our children's best interests in mind. He's the no-nonsense, old-fashioned, also mathematical, now godly man that I need in my life. I see now clearly that God was molding me to be who I am right now. Always a sinner, but not seeking approval in the wrong people. I'm a daughter of the one true king, and that is enough. My favorite quote is, no one can truly satisfy the human heart but the one who made it. So my testimony, which means to give evidence, is this. I am evidence. Jesus is the sign. Jesus is the sign. Here's your sign. Jesus is the sign. And on the cross, he said, Kim, I love you. Billy Graham said, once you've been to the cross, you'll never be the same. Truly been to it. Yes, that is so true. 
Jesus loved us enough not to only carry the cross, but to stay on it. One single word and thousands of angels could have come and taken him from that fate, but he stayed there for me and for you. So don't let another second go by if you haven't got an unquestionable, unequivocal, undeniable, unmistakable certainty that you have said yes to Jesus. Thank you. Our hymn of invitation is found on page 405, 405, Have Faith in God. Would you stand and sing, but more than stand and sing, if you have a need in your life this morning, will you come to the foot of the cross? Hymn number 405.